1744, near the deserts of the Nejed region in Central Arabia, a local ruler and a cleric met up. The Saudi Wahhabi deal, as it came to be known, would lay the foundation for modern Saudi Arabia. Over the next three centuries, the Saudi state fought tooth and nail for its very existence, having to come back from the brink of destruction a number of times. This persistence has paid off. In the 1930s, oil was discovered, allowing the kingdom to develop massively and become a regional powerhouse. Casual observers may feel satisfied thinking the answer to how Saudi Arabia became powerful is as simple as oil. But in truth, the black gold liquid can be as much of a curse as it is a gift. There are a number of countries in Asia and Africa replete with natural resources, but are among the poorest nations in the world. Instead, we need to look at the policies and strategies employed by successive Saudi rulers who used petrodollars to become one of the most prosperous and promising countries. Modern Saudi history is neatly divided into three convenient chapters. These correlate with three separate instances when a Saudi state was established. Most of our focus will be on the final and current Saudi state, but for context we need to start with the prior two versions. In 1727, Muhammad bin Saud al muqrin became the local emir of Dar'iyya, a town in the desert-like Najd region of Central Arabia. The most important event from his reign took place in 1744, when he made a religio-political pact with Muhammad bin Abdul Wahhab, a Sunni cleric with a particularly strict adherence to orthodoxy. This cooperation was essentially a power-sharing arrangement, whereby the al sheikh the family of Ibn Wahhab, would support Saudi political authority, whilst the Saudi royal family would maintain Wahhabi authority in religious matters. These are the two leading families in modern Saudi Arabia, and the arrangement made in the 1740s still holds true today. In the years following Muhammad bin Saud's death in 1765, the Saudi state would grow vastly, going on to reach the Red Sea in the west and the Persian Gulf in the east. But in order to achieve this, they came head to head with the declining yet still influential Ottoman Empire. The Sultan in Constantinople gave the task of neutralizing the House of Saud to Muhammad Ali Pasha, the powerful viceroy of Egypt. Under the command of the viceroy's son, Ibrahim Pasha, the Egyptians decimated the Saudis in a seven-year campaign that ended in 1818 with the collapse of the first Saudi state. But only six years later, the resilient Saudis rose up to expel the Egyptians from their former territories and established the second Saudi state. The Emirate of Nejd, as it was officially known, was not as successful as its former incarnation, this time being forced to accept Ottoman suzerainty and tribute payments. It lingered on until it was subsumed in 1891 by the Ottoman allied Emirate of Jabal Shamar to the north. The last Saudi ruler, Abdul Rahman bin Faisal, soon gave up interest in recapturing his patrimony and passed on the torch to his energetic and charismatic son, Abdul Aziz. He would be the one who would go on to establish the third and final Saudi state, in the process giving birth to what we now know as Saudi Arabia. Abdul Aziz, better known as Ibn Saud, was said to be a giant of a man, with estimates going up as high as six foot nine. The grandeur of his character matched his height, as he was arguably the greatest of all the Saudi rulers. Coming to power in 1902, over the course of the next three decades, he'd extend and unify the lands that would come to be known as Saudi Arabia. First, he sought to avenge the humiliation his father suffered at the hands of the Jabal Shamar Emirat. He was helped in this by the Ikhwan, a religious militia that formed the backbone of the Saudi army until the 1930s. In addition, he entered into an agreement with the British at the Treaty of Darin in 1915, whereby they would provide money and weapons in exchange for the Saudis becoming a British protectorate. Using these newfound resources to fund his expansionist goals, Ibn Saud was able to conquer his foes. 
by 1922, he had destroyed the Jabal Shamar Emirat. Three years later, the vital region of Hejaz was also incorporated into the Saudi realm as the Ikhwan ran over Sharif Hussein's forces and dislodged them from Mecca, Medina and Jeddah. Towards the end of his unification campaign, Ibn Saud would turn against the Ikhwan. The tribal army had been conducting trans-border raids in neighboring countries, undermining the sovereignty of the state he had fought so hard to regain. The Ikhwan believed Ibn Saud had lost sight of his Wahhabi values, and the two sides waged war on each other in 1927. Within two years, the Ikhwan tribesmen were overpowered by Ibn Saud's use of modern weaponry. With the country now unified under his undisputed authority, Ibn Saud reconstituted his realm as the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia in 1932. Had it not been for the British presence in the Middle East, it is likely that Ibn Saud would have continued his conquests. Before we go on to discuss the discovery of oil in Saudi Arabia, allow me to thank the sponsor of this video, Ground News. It is a website and app that shows you how news is being covered across the political spectrum. I've been using it and it's definitely helped me to gain a deeper understanding of the media landscape, especially because it has global coverage, thereby giving me access to international perspectives that are hard to find. Let's take a look at this story of American-Saudi talks on the potential normalization of relations between the Kingdom and Israel. Ground News gives me the coverage details, the political biases of the sources reporting it, as well as how factual it is, and its ownership status. Trust in media is at an all-time low, and for good reason too. Day by day, it is getting harder and harder to verify the information we consume whether it's manipulative algorithms, or clickbait content, or even the financial motivations of media companies. With Ground News, you can compare how a piece of news is covered by left, right, and center sources, thus allowing you to spot media biases. If you're looking for a better way to stay informed about current events around the world, go to ground.news. The link is in the description. If you subscribe through my link, you'll get 30% off unlimited access before October 15th. At this early stage, the infrastructure of the Saudi state was still fairly primitive. Therefore, Ibn Saud had to rely somewhat on foreign advisors, be it Westerners or Arabs, with prominent examples being John Philby and Hafiz Wahba. The Saudi king was also ahead of his time as a Middle Eastern ruler by developing a relationship with America. In 1933, he granted a concession to the Standard Oil Company of California to drill for oil. Little did he know that this single action more so than any other would change Saudi Arabia's destiny forever. On March 3, 1938, at Zahran in Eastern Arabia, petroleum was discovered. The black gold liquid would allow Ibn Saud to implement his ambitious vision of developing his realm into a powerhouse on the regional scene. But the wily old ruler was adept enough in politics to know this vision would be greatly aided if good relations were maintained with the United States. So, before even World War II had ended, he had a historic meeting with American President Franklin Roosevelt to discuss future cooperation between the two countries. It was not lost on the Saudi ruler or his future successors how important Saudi Arabia, specifically its supply of oil, was to America. The acknowledgement of this dynamic would be on full display in the Saudi state's assertive approach to its oil industry. In 1950, Ibn Saud gained a 50-50 split from profits after threatening to completely nationalize the country's oil industry. Ibn Saud would die in 1953 having established a solid foundation for a young state in such a volatile region. His vision of balancing the need to modernize with the traditional outlook of his people was continued by his son and successor Saud. Despite his accession, his younger brother Faisal was seen by many, perhaps even by his father, to be the more competent brother. Faisal had become a well-respected politician with decades of experience in foreign and domestic affairs. King Saud, on the other hand, was renowned for being a lavish spender. Even though oil production had exceeded an astonishing 1 million barrels per day, the Saudi economy went into a deficit. 
and even had to rely upon foreign borrowing. As Saud's reputation continued to suffer, Faisal's only grew. Soon enough, a rivalry between the two brothers ensued. In the end, Faisal emerged victorious, resulting in the deposal of Saud in 1964. The Arab world in this period was beset by a burgeoning rivalry between traditionalist monarchies and progressive republics. Egyptian President Jamal Abdel Nasser had galvanized millions across the Middle East and North Africa. But Faisal was a shrewd diplomat, skills he had doubtlessly attained during his 30-year stint as the Minister for Foreign Affairs. So he opted to iron out his differences with Nasser through direct diplomatic discussions. Faisal, unafraid of being assertive, positioned his country as a leader within the Islamic world, confidently using wealth generated by the oil industry to send aid to other Muslim nations. He also took a strong anti-Israel stance, taking the capture of Jerusalem in 1967 especially badly. In 1973, Faisal greatly angered his American allies when he led OPEC, an international organization consisting of the world's largest oil producers, to place an oil embargo on various Western nations that supported Israel. The price of oil subsequently increased by more than fourfold. This massive hike in price brought in a surplus of billions of dollars that could be used to both further Saudi ambitions in the region, as well as invest them back into the country's domestic infrastructure. At the same time, he followed in his father's footsteps by increasing the Saudi share of its own oil industry. In 1973, the Saudi government bought a 25% interest in Aramco. The following year, they'd increase it to 60%, before going on to buy the company outright in 1980. In 1975, however, Faisal would be assassinated by his own nephew. Had he continued to live and rule, it's interesting to wonder how he would have got on. Faisal had already positioned himself as a leader in the Ummah, and the 1980s were a time when political Islam made a resurgent comeback. One can only wonder how the wily old diplomat would have fared with the aggression and ambition of Saddam Hussein. In any case, he was succeeded by his half-brother Khalid, who essentially continued what Faisal was doing both internally and externally. Plus, during his reign, the kingdom got to benefit from increased oil revenues coming to Saudi Arabia because of the hike in prices as well as the full nationalization of Aramco. The most noteworthy incident of Khalid's reign came in 1979, when Islamic extremists seized the Masjid al-Haram, the Grand Mosque of Mecca, which is the holiest site in Islam. Calling for the overthrow of the Al Saud family, the insurgents were defeated after two weeks as the Islamic world watched in disbelief. The event did force the Saudi royal family to slow down the pace of their social modernization policies and instead move towards empowering the conservative ulama. King Khalid would die from heart problems in 1982 and was succeeded by his half-brother Fahd. The new king had a prior reputation in the 1950s and 60s as an alcohol drinking playboy with a special affinity for gambling and was attracted by the pleasures of a western lifestyle. After having numerous confrontations with his half-brother King Faisal, one which resulted in the king reportedly slapping his wayward brother, Fahad had seemingly brought his excesses under control and focused more on statecraft. During his reign, he acted upon his pro-Western leaning by bringing the kingdom even closer to the USA. He coordinated with the Americans and Kuwaitis to deliver crucial aid to Saddam Hussein in his war against the Iranians. Then, in 1990, when Saddam could not repay the loans given to him by his erstwhile allies, he decided to take over Kuwait. The Western world held its breath. Saddam was now in control of 20% of the world's oil supply. If Saudi Arabia was next on his list, seen by many observers as the logical next step, then this scenario could have had earth-shattering consequences for global geopolitics. So King Fahad took the momentous step to invite the Americans to station their forces inside the kingdom. Soon enough, Saddam's forces were expelled out of Kuwait and never harmed Saudi oil fields, but the consequences of this decision would resonate for decades afterwards. Prominent Islamic fundamentalists during the War on Terror would constantly reference the presence of American soldiers on Saudi soil, the home of the Kaaba, 
as a primary motivator for their actions. Domestically, oil revenue had dried up compared to the dizzying heights they reached in the 1970s, meaning there was substantially less money to invest in the infrastructure of the kingdom. In 1995, Fahad's unhealthy lifestyle caught up with him as he suffered a debilitating stroke that forced him to concede the day-to-day -day running of the country to the Crown Prince Abdullah. By the time Fahad passed away in 2005, Abdullah had almost a decade of experience as the de facto ruler. He had guided the country through the turbulent start of the war on terror, which particularly concerned him as many Islamic extremists had roots in Saudi Arabia, with the obvious one being the most wanted man in the world for over a decade. Even though there was a series of bombings inside the country in the 2000s, Saudi authorities largely did a good job of containing the threat by cracking down on extremism. When the Arab Spring threatened the position of the Middle Eastern status quo, King Abdullah reacted decisively by promising to spend hundreds of billions more on internal infrastructure like housing, jobs and healthcare. The king also put in place a government scholarship program which sent out thousands of Saudi students to universities globally. Many of these went to Western institutions. This highlights a key development which has come to shape modern Saudi Arabia. For the past 50 or 60 years, younger princes of the Saudi family or even non-royals were sent to the West for their education and in turn were expected to bring back technical knowledge that could be applied inside Saudi Arabia. This policy has been remarkably successful thus far and could point to one of the main reasons for the kingdom's success in recent years. The government has subsequently moved to establish their own higher institutions so that Saudi does not become dependent on Western training, with the King Abdullah University of Science and Technology being a key example. In early 2015, King Abdullah passed away at the age of 90, to be succeeded by his younger brother Salman. He had been the governor of the capital Riyadh for almost 50 years, during which time the city became a major urban metropolis. He was a member of the Sudairi Seven, so called because it was an alliance of seven full brothers among the sons of Ibn Saud. Under King Salman, the kingdom's rivalry with Iran became much more intense as numerous proxy wars were fought by the two sides, namely in Yemen and Syria. These tensions with Ayatollah ruled Iran were reduced in March 2023 when the two countries decided to re-establish diplomatic relations after a seven-year suspension. At the same time as all of this has been happening, the Saudi royal family has been becoming a gerontocracy, meaning that the rulers are becoming really old. As a result, Salman's son Muhammad has slowly but surely been attaining more power. Known to many by his initials, MBS, he was named defense minister in 2015, two years later going on to be made the crown prince, and from 2022, as a result of his father's worsening health, he was made Prime Minister. Many commentators believe that he is effectively the de facto ruler of Saudi Arabia at the moment. Foreign policy wise, Kingdom has enjoyed ever closer relations with China and Russia under MBS, whilst that special relationship with America has become strained at times. The Crown Prince has left many observers confused. On the one hand, he is clearly an ambitious reformer who wants to modernize his society, but on the other hand, he is particularly repressive and has drawn criticism for his heavy-handed approach to things. In November 2017, there was a sudden and shocking arrest of hundreds of Saudi princes, businessmen and government ministers. Officially, MBS claimed that the operation's intentions was to stamp out corruption within the financial and political sectors. But unofficially, it is widely viewed as a purge that allowed MBS to remove rivals and consolidate his own authority. The Saudi Vision 2030 program was created in 2016 to help achieve three main ambitious aims. To make Saudi Arabia the heartland of the Arab and Islamic worlds, to become a global investment powerhouse, and to become a global hub connecting three continents, Asia, Africa and Europe. If they are to achieve these goals and become regionally or even globally dominant, it could mean a very exciting and assertive future for the Middle East. Saudi Arabia is providing a blueprint for everyone in the Islamic world on how to rise above mediocrity. 
They are doing this by investing money into their domestic infrastructure. Yes, they have been gifted something valuable in oil, but that can't ensure their future unless the money is used to build up the society. So you spend on things like education and healthcare. At the same time, there are many potential pitfalls that the Saudi government has to look out for. Dictatorial conditions are not a sustainable strategy. Yes, they can work in bursts or on a short-term basis, but long-term, people will not stand for it. You will lose. Secondly, spend well. Yes, you have a lot of money and well done for having a plan, but do not be wasteful. And last but not least, do not change too quickly. This is non-negotiable. In truth, it is negotiable, but quick change can only work under a very specific combination of factors. Most commonly, it results in the screws from the machine becoming loose and subsequently breaking down. As usual, big thank you to my patrons for continuing to support me. If you want to become a patron and help Hikma History grow, check out the link in the description below. Until next time, peace!